Time for Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at the Ann Arbor District Library, aadl.org, on the corner of 5th and William in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist, and uh, with me today, we're going to talk a little bit about community, we're going to talk about organizing events <clears throat> about, uh, around comics. Uh, and with me today, we've got uh, two very busy people because in two weeks, they're putting on a show. Uh, Onizumi Harstein and Harknell. Should I just call you Harknell or is it James Harknell? My first name's James, so yeah. But people but, call me both because of the characters named Harknell that I'm, you know, that's based on me. So it kind of goes both ways. <laughs> but but Oni always just calls you Harknell. So I guess if yeah. if she calls yeah. you that, then we should all call you that. Harknell. So and and it's Onizumi, but you also go by Oni, right? Yeah, that's easier for most people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so okay. Cartoonists, yes, you make comics, and then, oh my gosh, I gotta pull up my Evernote here, because I pulled up, like, all your cr credentials, Oni, and uh, it's it's absurd, all the stuff that you do. Uh, and it's, it's a really good reminder, too, that, like, you know, the, the common advice that gets kicked around is there's no one way into comics, uh, or the comics industry, or a professional life in comics, like, everybody has to find their own path, and uh, you could easily extrapolate that out into... Um, there's no one model of being a cartoonist, right? I mean, it's not just about like your publishing strategy. It's also like, gosh, you're, gosh, you're like a cartoonist advocate as well as, right? Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I fought my way up and I've seen, you know, a lot of misconceptions about what it's like to be a cartoonist and they're, they're misconceptions. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I've always been very vocal about the scene and, and I just think the scene has been very supportive of me, so it's the least I can do. Um, okay, but you do, you did, you've been doing a webcomic for how many years now? What is it, like eight, nine years? 2003. Yeah, I was going to say, like, uh, Stupid and Insane Defenders Against Chaos is your webcomic. And I remember seeing that when I was first starting out back in, like, yeah, uh, early 2003. I remember seeing it all over, um, oh, what was the, the comics, Comicspedia, I think is what it was called at the time. It has a different name now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very different comic from what I, I do now. I, I no longer think it's the best thing ever to kind of cram as many naughty words as I can <laughs> into each panel and as many poop jokes. Well, right out of college. So yeah, I was that's, a very that's angry a pretty typical thing for you know, <laughs> It's now a different thing. It's more PG. It would PG, PG-13. Yeah, I mean, it's more of the horror elements, you know, the theoretical back stuff. Every once be, in a while they swear you know, now. And people and, get killed and, uh, randomly sometimes, but... But this comic's still updating while you're putting on a convention, too. Yeah, I mean, Stupid and Insane has been kind of stagnant for a few weeks. I'm uh, Part of the reason is I'm actually also working on the first print book for it. So I kind of have to get caught up. And then I had this thing where, hey, I wanted to hand draw everything. And then I realized that was kind of crazy because I can't do a sketch and go through all the processes, which are fun, but I can't actually do that and meet the deadline of that and the deadline of doing my annoying life and the deadline of doing my blog and the deadline of doing my NJ.com blog and the deadline of my day job and the deadline of everything involved in the convention. So I'm <laughs> digitally again. <laughs> and yeah, that's the other thing. It's like, I want to go, th go through this step by step because, okay, so you make a comic, that's hard enough. You know, I mean, a lot of people have a hard time keeping up with a comic, but then you run Onizumiverse. Is that how you say it? Onizumiverse. Sure. And you post tutorials for people on how to do what you do. You know, having done a few tutorials myself and doing some teaching work myself, that isn't easy organizing your thoughts into some kind of procedure or some kind of recipe that other people can follow. So that's a lot of work. Uh, and then you've got the Webcomic Central app service. Tell us about this. This is crazy. Well, that's more what you're doing right now because I helped develop it and then he's packaging it. Um, it's basically a, um, I realized a long time ago that us, we as creators, we have different things on you know, YouTube, on Facebook, um, you know, on Twitter, we're everywhere. And it's easy for a viewer to miss what we're doing. So it's basically an app where you can see everything that the person is updating all in one spot. And I made it for myself. And like a lot of other things, I figured, hey, let's just release it and, you know, give it to other people for free. I mean, probably isn't the smartest idea because it's <laughs> free and it's work on our part, but just how we are. <laughs> well, do you have any kind of uh, idea, uh, Harknell, uh, how many people are actually using these free iPhone apps, these customized, uh, customizable ones? Yeah, I haven't looked at the statistics for a while. Um, usually when we give them out to other people, I 
I don't really track their usage as much just because I don't want to be creepy and be looking in on <laughs> how many people they're doing stuff. But um, an example, funny enough, is we adapted the actual basic um, program for intervention. So we actually have an intervention version of the app, which is uh, running. And last year, out of the 500 people that we had, it was a, probably a good 10, 15 maybe even 20% or more of the people I saw walking around with their iPads, iPhones, were using that app, um, and it's only expanded for this year. Um, now, that's kind of a small number for that particular one, which is, you know, 10, 20% of your audience, but it's, it seems fairly consistent for all the other apps that, that was about the numbers that was happening. So, you know, if we released it for somebody with a smaller comic, it might be anywhere from like a few hundred people using it, to some of the bigger comics, you know, all the way up into maybe a few thousand people. So it really, you know, for those people that really want to keep connected with, you know, people's Twitters, Facebook pages, you know, RSS feeds for comics, um, those which, you know, for people who do those kind of feeds, it's probably about consistent for how many people use that concept anyway. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, yeah, just to put it in a nutshell, it's an app that will aggregate all of your disparate presences into a single place that's easily accessible through iOS and is it through Android too or is it just through yeah, iOS right now? Android version yet. Um, we, we've actually solicited a few times and a few people have said oh well maybe I could work on it but up to this point we haven't gotten it solidified with a, a programmer who can do the, the Android side of things. Okay. We're looking. <laughs> but still I mean iOS is um, it seems like a lot of people have those devices. Last I heard, they were pretty popular. So it seems like you're, you're getting a lot. <laughs> Nobody's gonna buy an iPad. <laughs> uh, but but okay. But you know, this comes comes around. This kind of leads me to a central idea that I was noticing about you know your careers is that if it does follow a lot of that internet model of give stuff away, like the, the the things you need in order to build a constituency and build a community is to be. Um, you know, accessible, helpful, nice, and give stuff away, right? And then that leads to a business, ultimately. But if you front end that business too much and you make it too much about, oh, you want a customizable iPhone app? Well, it'll be $5, please. Um, you have a lot a harder time, you know, building that constituency, right? I mean, like with, with things like intervention, if, if you, the fees were too exorbitant to participate, then it'd be really hard to get this thing off the ground. So that leads me to my final point that I want to bring up as we introduce you guys to the audience. You also, on top of all this other stuff, you organize a convention called interventioncon.com, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what's, what's, what's the log line for that? This is, uh, I mean, you, you chose the name intervention for a very specific reason. Yeah, I mean, we're really here to like, like intervene and inspire people to you know, become better people through all of this geekiness that we love. I mean, would you say that's a fair? I mean, yeah. Uh, we, you know, some of our other taglines are your online life in person. Um, the concept with intervention is it's a shortening of two words, which is internet and convention into one. And we like the, we like the way it sounded and the way it felt because too many people, I mean, the origins of the event in many ways were when we go to at many other cons and we were guests, one of the biggest things people would ask us is, well, how did you get involved with what you're doing, how did you, you know, start your comic, how did you become a guest, how did you do all this stuff. And the next step they almost always said was, oh, well, I'm not good enough. Oh, I can never do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's just no way anybody would care about what I, what I do. And one of the biggest things we'd usually try to do is just like grab them and be like, yes, you can. <laughs> and when it came down to naming the event, the word intervention you know, that notion of grabbing somebody and breaking them of an incorrect thought really played into why we, we really like the name. Because that's part of what the whole point of going to the event is. Learning how to do what we do. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really frustrating to me. And I mean, not frustrating in a negative way, but it's like a lot of times the people that say they never could do it are people that I perceive as having better work than me. So it's kind of like, seriously, dude? <laughs> well, that's an artist thing. Everybody in the universe yeah. does better, better work because you just, oh, it's never good enough. Yeah. yeah that's no, true. It definitely is a whole thing. Like, you know, I was not, I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be here at all today. 
And, you know, it was through comics and through conventions and through people who were nice enough to take the time out of their day for me when I was like a teenager or, you know, even in college to just say, you know, look at my stuff and, and maybe give me some pointers. And, and that's why I managed to make it through college. I managed to, you know, get a nice job and, and make a life for myself and uh, be so, able to do what we're doing today. Yeah. <laughs> Paying it back. <laughs> yeah, but okay. Let's go. Let, this perhaps this is a, uh, anachronistic thinking, and and maybe I'm you know stupid for even bringing this up. But I'm hearing the voice of somebody who's saying, "Oh gosh, somebody comes up to you and says, how do you break in? How do you do? How do you get involved? How do you do, disseminate your work? You really want to give away your secrets like that? I mean, if you're going to do it, why not put it in a DVD series and sell it for fifty nine ninety nine and go do a speaking tour and sell people your your you know snake oil that way." Because that's the way you make the, the money off of this. Seems like you guys are taking out an awful lot of work just to make a bunch of people empowered to steal your jobs. I mean, having it, what's that? Uh, I, was, I would say it, it, it's, you're just empowering people to, to ultimately steal your work, right? Don't you have to protect your, your careers? Oh, the audio just froze. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so oh. you, you totally cut off for a second and then you froze. Okay. <laughs> um, so, okay. Uh, I actually am going to be writing a book, but I think that a lot of people are interested in having it all in one place. You know, like for me, I will read and learn, and then I will actually buy something that is more comprehensive, because if if somebody has all the time to hunt down every single thing that I've ever said and, and splice it together, I mean, that's going to take them days and days, and it's not going to have everything laid out for them perfectly. I, I think that there's really no harm in telling people quote unquote secrets, you know, I think art is, it's not like, I always tell people, it's not like Big Macs, it's like apples and oranges really, everyone's art is different and um, you know, I just don't think there's any harm in, in just putting yourself out there. Well, we've always felt that working with other people as, a, as opposed to against other people was always more beneficial to everybody. I mean, if you think about it for a second, um, let's just say the first person who ever came out with a webcomic locked it up. There was no way anybody else was ever going to do it. I mean, yeah, theoretically, there's one webcomic, but do you think the concept of being a webcomic artist would actually go anywhere if only one person knew how to do it? You know, it's sort of like any genre or anything. If you get, if you expand it, everybody's opportunity grows. If you lock it down, at best, you might be able to keep like a little bit of it to yourself, but you really you kill something by keeping it locked up. And it's always better to have more friends than have you know people that just don't work out. I mean, it's true with with events as well. You know, uh, many people see their event in in relation to others as competition, and we've never felt that way either. We've worked with a million other events and many of them are doing table exchanges at our event and we're going to theirs. So it's all part of our strategy of working communally. Yeah, and there's a guy named Tim Ferriss who writes books about networking and he's aimed more at marketing um, executives. But he actually has a whole section in I think his first or second book talking about how you almost always improve your position by connecting to people. There's never a there's never a negative thing that happens to you by connecting to people. You're not going to waste that connection. It's just going to make everything better because that person is going to be more likely to help you out when you need it. And I found that that's true in, in my experience. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I, you know, I think the event that, that we're doing could have happened if we hadn't worked in that way. But the number of people, I mean, look at our guest list from last year. If you go to interventioncon.com and look in the archive and look at the number of people that are going to the event this year. And the overwhelming number of those people came to the event to help us basically because they knew what we were doing was real we we earnestly want to give back to them as much as they're contributing to the event and i don't think if we had really tried to take the approach of of you know oh no 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 this is us we're not going to let you know that the event would have worked as well as it did or go as well as it's going you know it just it proves our point working with other people comes back to help you more than you even gave out. I mean, it's it's like, you know, you give out a little bit and the wave that comes back is, is humongous. Yeah. And that's just the way we I do it. I kind things. of looked at it at first as like a science experiment because some people have said, oh, you know, you should be a little more protective. I'm like, well, first off, that's not my personality. 
And second off, I'm like, let's just do this as a science experiment and just be totally upfront, just be who I am and, and see what happens. And I've seen all good things. Yeah. I mean, the feedback from last year was, is, was incredible. And uh, so far this year, the number of people, you know, buying pre-regs and stuff and talking about the event and all the other press we've gotten has just been really spectacular. And we're, we're really just happy. Well, okay, so we're talking about earnestness and openness, and those are good things, and that that's something that uh, people can uh, engender in themselves for sure. But now we got to get to something that I think is actually quite difficult. Um, you plant the flag on the ground. And people gather around it, and you, your first reaction, I mean, I went through this with Kids Read Comics. We planted a flag in the ground, and this, all these people said, yeah, this is a great idea. And you're like, oh, wow, I didn't think I could do that. Now you got to be a good leader. I'm wondering, this is probably where most of the spade work of your jobs comes from. How? Uh, look, 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 let's say, uh, following this premise that you guys are open and want to share, I'm sure you'd be just as excited if other people start up their own community events in their own cities, states, principalities, whatever, uh, provinces. Um, but then they're going to say, well, gosh, you know, I've got the earnestness. I've got the drive and the spirit. How do you be a good leader? How do you lead a group like that? Because, I mean, uh, you, you any stories you could share about, like, things that you – lessons learned from putting the show together and now your second time through? about yourselves as a person and then also about administering something, right? Because you got, what, 50 people working for you now? Yeah, I mean, we, we took the long road to kind of get to square one with the con. So a lot of what we did is we watched how other people worked when they didn't think anybody was watching at other events. So I kind of had a good idea, like all of my key positions that I actually trust, um, and you know, that, those are people that I rely on to get things done for me. They were people that I had vetted very, very heavily over the last five years. So I have these guys, you know, and girls, and, and, and probably a ferret. I don't know. I have everyone working for me. Maybe I have a ferret. But <laughs> I like ferrets. That, uh, you know, that are able to kind of bring in people that they know. And, you know, there have been a couple occasions where we have had to, you know, not... There have been some people that didn't work out last year. There was a total of one, actually. And, um, you know, that's, that it happens. But what I try to do is I make sure that they're in a position where there is redundancy so that if they, a person I don't know, you know, fails or, or leaves or whatever, that it can be easily taken care of. And I have about four or five of my staff that I trust that are in like what I call reserves, they're unassigned. So at the con, if something doesn't go right, I'm going to be like, you over there, you over there, do it. You know, and it's, it's just going to, you know, just planning for, you know, the worst case scenario, I guess. And we, uh, you know, we took years to develop the concept and, and also to get experience. We worked at quite a number of other events. Of course, we were guests and, and uh, vending at, at quite, a, quite many other events. But we actually really, you know, took the time to do it. We didn't jump right into it. We didn't like, you know, oh, we know everything. We're just going to, you know, whatever. And the parts that we didn't know, we specifically went out and found people that we knew knew it. Like the children's programming. Exactly. I'm not a mom. I don't know what like a five-year-old kid is going to necessarily want. I mean, I, I'm, I'm good with kids, but I'm not a teacher. So we got a K-12 through school teacher to head that up, and we got Helen, uh, Helen McLaughlin, and we got Brian McLaughlin and we got Matt Bloom from, you know, Geek Dad, Geek Mom, you know, Wired.com to kind of, you know, design this programming for us. Yeah. And the same thing is true for everything. Our operations manager, our hotel liaison, uh, you know, guest coordinators, everybody has been involved in doing events. Some of them 10 plus years, even yeah. more. And, um, you know, we, we really took the time, we, we looked at the people that we needed, and we grabbed them when the time came, came through. Yeah, it was kind it was of just like, a great uh, combination of time. Kind of like, you know, on Dragon Ball Z, where you charge the energy ball for 17 episodes and then let that thing yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we here early on about what we wanted to do, what our concepts were, you know, the idea that this was going to be the type of event that, you know, you go there, and uh, you have fun, you don't get pushed around, you don't feel like you're being herded around. You know, we want it to be a big community, family, networking kind of vibe. 
Um, and uh, you know, everybody pretty much joined in. That was that was what they were shooting for as well. So, you know, it's one big family feeling going on. I love this idea though of what you guys said about taking the time to train by going to other conventions and volunteering. I know we talked about this before when I talked to you guys in the past on other podcasts, but this should be underlined again and again, because this isn't as simple as the Mickey Rooney, Julie Garland film. Let's put on a show in the barn and we can do it right here, right? <laughs> it, it, it really should be underscored both for people who want to organize events like this, but also for people who attend events like this, that there is a lot of research and homework that goes into making the thing run right. Right, because you guys are protecting yourselves against the unknown, um, but also it's about finding your sea legs and finding out how these things are actually administered by participating as a volunteer. That's a great way. That's really smart on your parts to actually go ahead and do that at other people's shows. You're helping a show, but you're also gleaning uh, experience that you're going to need to run your own shows, right? And probably you probably learned a few things about what not to do by doing that. I'll bet. Which we don't have to be specific about, but I mean, that, that's up to everybody to do themselves. But also this other idea of embracing your weaknesses and saying, like, look, I don't know how to do this. And instead of pretending, instead of, like, trying to be the big, brave leader and say, ah, I'll just do kids programming. And, and uh, <laughs> you kids like clowns, right? <laughs> uh, and then why are you all crying? Uh, so, but bringing in somebody who actually knows how to do it, I think that's a great thing to, uh, as well. Is that's I, that's only this comes probably from your years of experience as, as a team leader and administrator in your day work, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I have been. Uh, you know, I work in like project office that manages projects and things like that. So, yeah. application development mostly, and and you know some web producing, but yeah. It definitely, that's the other thing, like if somebody didn't have convention experience, I'm like, well, what do you do for your day job? If somebody does IT support for their day job, I can generally assume I can put them in our AV and they're going to be okay, um, you know, working with somebody else. But generally new people are always put at like kind of a lower level just in case. And like the first year is the test and then I put them up higher. Yeah, yeah. Test, test them out, letting them get the experience and prove themselves, sure. Um, commiserating time. You guys, uh, how are you sleeping? Um, pretty good, maybe. As much as possible, but <laughs> not that much. <laughs> yeah, especially right now. I mean, uh, let's look at the dates. I mean, we've got, uh, it's the weekend after this coming weekend, but for folks who are listening to this after the fact, we're looking at September 16th through 18th, 2011, at the Hilton, Washington, D.C., in Rockville. Um, not the same weekend as SPX this time. Nope. 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 Week later. That is something, I mean, as it, have, being one of the co-organizers of the Kids Read Comics event, that is a nightmare trying to figure out what weekend to run your show because you don't want it to overlap anything else because either A, it means that your certain guests you want won't be able to make it because they're already committed to another show, or B, people are going to see that as some kind of political move even if it's not. You know, it's like, oh, are you trying to compete with someone? No, we just put it that weekend. We didn't know that somebody else had a thing going on that weekend. This isn't like some kind of battle for who wins. <laughs> Um, not that I'm saying anybody said that about what happened last year, but it's just, it, it does become problematic picking a weekend. That's one. That's hard, right? Because there's so many other shows. Uh, and then I, I remember having discussions where somebody said, like, oh, something's going on in Wyoming that weekend. I'm like, dude, we're in Michigan. You know, don't worry about it. You know, it's, it's okay if it overlaps, if it's a significant distance. But at this point, you guys have had to do web design web programming. One of the things I love about what you guys do is um, you randomize your guests on the guest list so that uh, it's not like, here's our star, and, oh, and here's these other people who are attending too. But that takes programming expertise to do that, right? That's um, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, th th that's like a, 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 a significant amount of force, uh, forethought and real focus about what your brand means, right, uh, as an event. But then there's print, print materials, banners, advertisements, doing things like this, doing like press appearances to promote this thing. Um, what's one of the hardest things that you guys have experienced so far uh, this year? Difficult, not not annoying, just difficult. Well, you know, this year, like the, the process for intervention is ongoing. Last year, we set up a wiki to uh, try to get people to generate some ideas for programming. Wikis are really great for some things, but they're absolutely terrible for others. And a lot of people really grooved on the wiki concept, but the problem is the people who know how to use wikis are a very subset of regular people. 
So it was kind of difficult. Some people didn't know exactly how, how do you do it, how do you add things. So we moved, you know, so we moved a lot of our infrastructure for that sort of stuff to an entirely new platform. And of course, anytime you change anything, there's new new difficulties and you know, we're you know, a lot of the tech infrastructure on the website updated this year. We changed a lot of look and feel. So, I mean, we're always trying to find the easiest way to to enable people to be able to interact. You know, it's a, it's an ongoing process. So for me, the Panel you know, selection, yeah. That that's always a an interesting process, and uh, you know I don't think we've made it perfect this year either. You know we'll see how we can make it better. Yeah, we're definitely going to change that next year. It's it's just the hardest thing to you know let people have feedback, and then to get once you get all the panels that you want, it's like okay, well who suggested this? Well the system doesn't have the person's name, so I have to go in the system. We had to print out all the stuff, and we had a big pile of paper here, and we had a big pile of paper there, and we're like playing like a puzzle game that really was not fun. And uh, we're just like, ah, and then somebody was like, wait, I didn't get on my panel. And I'm like, hold on for a second. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to like adjust this selection process next year. I, there's no real, I've been talking to some other events. There's no real easy way to do it. I mean, after a certain point in time, it just comes down to people looking at things and just, you know, figuring it out how you're going to do it. And there's no, certainly no automated process that would ever easily exist because, you, you know, you have to have, you know, you have to put people on there that you know are going to do well and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. you know, it's just an ongoing thing. And, you know, this year I think it went a little bit easier than last year, but it's, you know. And then there's the trouble where we didn't want anybody to have a panel opposite something that would make most of the convention not attend their panel. I mean, I've been on panels where they put the webcomics panel opposite opening ceremonies, and there's five people inside a 200-person room for all of webcomics. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh, I don't want to do that to anybody. <laughs> I mean, it's always choices about, you know, putting things opposite, things that you know are going to be fairly popular. So what you always try to do is, you know, put people who have an entirely different group interested in that, maybe, maybe a niche or a hardcore group. Um, that you know that they're pretty much going to go to that particular other event, um, not the one that may be more generally popular. Yeah, like, it's, if, it's, like if you have like a, like we have a, like a cosplay burlesque, we could put like a parenting thing opposite that, or or something that is completely divergent, and and that would you know work. <laughs> I don't know yeah. what we ended up putting opposite it, but well, you know, some that's other what we'll some more at. things that have their own hardcore fans. Yeah. Yeah, this is what I maintain at the tail end of every Kids Read Comics cycle is I work with all of the teaching artists to develop their programming or work with them with their pre-developed programming, and then i got to figure out where it's going to fall, what room it's going to be in, how not to overlap things in a weird way, and also get it to where – this was a real challenge with this last year's event – get it to where there's time for people to just browse Artist Alley. So yeah. so you're not just kind of moving from program to program because when you get a lot of – I'm looking at the intervention program schedule. There's a lot of really interesting stuff that you guys are doing, and this is going to lead me to another point that I want to get to in a second here about uh, the future of conventioning. Um, but you don't want to set it up also to where people are just going to be like, wow, there's so much interesting – uh, rich uh, workshops and discussions going on. Who needs the artist alley? And then you got all these tabling artists who are peeved because they don't get any traffic. For and they're they're paying for their tables to support you and whatnot. So yeah, it's that is an enormous juggling act, and I do not envy that that uh, that job for you guys either. I know exactly what you're going through. It's tough. I I manage all mine through email, and I got to find a better system. Uh, it's it's tough talking with like you know 20 different people via email about their different projects. Uh, Gmail is great, but its tagging system isn't that great yeah. Um, yeah, it's not and then they have that weird thing where they put all the emails for the chain into one thing and then I, I don't realize there's a new message I'm like ah yeah yeah because not everybody knows that if, if it's a whole new topic that they need to make a new message and so they'll just tag that new topic in the ongoing thread and it's like ah how do you man how do you maintain and manage that you can't um, but th this is another thing it's a year-round job you know it's like it's like yeah you just get to put on a show and go ah you know, I'm going to go sleep for three days. Well, maybe you sleep for a day, and then you get back to work on 2013, 20, you know? Yeah, last actually... year it was, um, I, I was working, I went home and I didn't even go to sleep on the Monday after because when the artists leave, we're still there, and we spend the night there, and we clean up, and we have a meeting with the hotel and, and, and close everything off. 
I went home and immediately sat down in front of my computer doing 2011, and I'll probably do the same thing. Well, this we've year. already theoretically started 2012 yeah, in some ways. We are actually. We have some stuff that we're working on be because you know timing and you know you have to get some things out of the way really early. So yeah, it, it's pretty much you know year round. Uh, usually starts up really heavy in December for our dates in September. Um, you know, we do take a little bit of a break after the event for, for a brief period of time, but, you know, we were already talking the other day about, oh, that means in November we have to definitely start doing this, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's, but that's the way it is, you know, it's, you can't do anything, you know, like this with, without really being in it for the long haul yeah. and really being in it for, you know, serious, you know, sake, and that's how we take it, and that's how we want it to grow and grow. So that's and that's just the way it goes, you know. Yeah, I mean this year it's like we were kind of figuring it out still, but uh, next year I'm going to actually formalize a production schedule and actually I don't know if I'll do it in Microsoft Project or what. I'm going to actually have milestones and and I'm going to try to look for software that all my department heads can kind of check in with status on. I don't know how successful. Have that's you guys have you guys looked into uh, 37 Signals? I mean that's the one that I've been toying with right now for something like that. Uh, Basecamp is the name of the software. I've heard, I've heard I'll check that out. I have it, it has calendars, milestones, it has notes that can be shared with the whole organization. Uh, they recently upgraded their free plan to where you can even upload files to it now. You can actually share like different image files or P PDFs or you know Word documents and whatnot. But uh, as far as like organizing like to-do lists, task management, and then associating them with milestones on a calendar that can be subscribed to by your user base, it's really interesting. Uh, yeah, it's 37signals.com, and the, the product is called Basecamp. They have a free version, but it's really hard to find. Like they have like when you go to their sales page. <laughs> So. Yeah, you go to the sales page, there's like four different tiers, and then like a really small print underneath, there's like, or you can subscribe to our free plan. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. That's, uh, that, that's, you know, speaking about online, there's a huge number of services like that that yeah. are yeah. springing up to do the online uh, project management tools for, you know, groups and things like that. And it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely where I think people are going to move to, so... You know, yeah. that and quite a number of other ones. There's even some for WordPress. I think there's a few plugins that have, uh, I remember there was a while ago, there was a plugin for it, but uh, I don't know if it actually continued much. Um, we haven't seriously reevaluated those, but, you know, sometimes it's just better to go with somebody who's already got the robust system set up. Yeah. So. yeah. 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 Um, Okay, big idea, headline that I want to grab onto here that, that was permeating a lot of what you guys are talking about. This idea of dedication. Oni, you said in publicly that you know a convention is a five-year plan, if not longer. Um, one of the things that I get asked a lot about for, by people who want to organize their own community events, and then I want to get to the importance of community after that, is, um, you know, well, how do we get people to attend? How do we get people to show up? I'm like, well, you, you have to just keep punching at it. The first one you do, you're going to have three people. Second one you do, you're going to have ten people. And you keep punching, keep punching, keep punching, because people will not attend unless they know that you are committed. And the only, one of the big ways to show your commitment is to just do it over and over again, right? And, and really, and think of it that way. Yeah, I mean, it's like anything. I mean, we, you know, in a different, slightly different context, we get people who talk to us all the time about, like, their comic. And, you know, they have maybe a few comics up, and they're like, how come I don't have, like, a million people go to my site? It's like, well, you know, people do want to see that you're serious about it. You know, people don't get invested very easily in things, uh, especially if you're doing, like, a storyline comic. Put up, like, 30 or 40 pages. Think of it, you know, like you're, you have to get that basic, you know, platform or, or the, the, the default level that people will get in, involved with it. And the same thing is true with events. I mean, you know, one of our team members, the quote was, this year's event is the promotion for next year's event. And that's pretty much true. I mean, you know, last year we were really, you know, happy that we had over 500 people come to the event. You know, we were opposite SPX. Uh, we know there were a huge, a huge number of people who told us they were going to come who didn't because they, you know, had already committed to go to SPX for at least the bulk of the day. And then, you know, people get tired. They don't come over um, after that. And, uh, you know, having that, that first year of the 500 people, you know, means that your next year may be 700, 800 people, and then your next year is more and more. And it, it's one of those things where we've done a lot of analysis about other events, and it really is true. 
people who go the first year bring a friend for the next year or they tell a few other friends and it that's how anything grows I mean you have to kind of jump in it you have to know that even if your first year is 150 people you know as long as you do a great job and those 150 people love what you did and they're grooving on it you might have 300 people because they tell one person each and drag them there and you know you just have to do a good job and and just know that what you're doing is right and, and just keep going yeah, I think the first Zenkai Con had like a hundred some people and now they're over two thousand I think they might even be three something yeah they might be one. over three thousand and that point. that was what in like five years F about five years yeah so I mean that's a pretty pretty good um, growth for an anime con um, you know not very you Especially know, very new often did it grow that fast. Yeah, exactly. It's a really saturated market. So. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it's it's you know it's just the way it goes. And you know, again, the feedback we got last year was overwhelmingly positive. And you know, that's that's what we just shot for. I want to round back to an earlier point we were talking about. You guys said that uh, you, the organizers, by putting on a thing like this, by sharing openly and giving away information, you benefit a lot more than you might expect. Um, for somebody who is interested in starting up a community uh, event or uh, some kind of group, some kind of like, whether it's a reading group, a drawing group, or like a full-on event where you're trying to you know advocate to your your craft to the public at large, uh, but you know it's like in the case of intervention, one of the really things that makes it stand out is how much hands-on programming. Like you can go to this thing as a fan of comics, or you can go as a, pr a a practitioner and learn a whole lot too, right? So you're really casting your net wide that way, um, which makes more work for you. But um, but this creates a sense of uh, community. Let's let's me and my buddy who make comics go to this thing where we can learn more about making comics. Uh, why why go through all that trouble? Uh, you know what what benefits? I can make comics at home by myself. I don't need to go around people to do it. You know uh, what 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 benefits do I get as a person for participating in such a thing? Well, as far as that, it's we market everyone who works with us as an expert, and it's interesting to see the amount of people that came to me after the convention last year. And I was surprised to hear this, but maybe not so surprised. They were just like, wow, we did intervention, and now we're getting invites to all these other events. I mean, the thing that I, I always try to look at, you know, we don't have a ton of money. What can I personally do to add value to everything that I do? And that is marketing people really well. That's why all the sponsors that, you know, we wanted back this year said, yeah, we want to come back. Because you guys really, really showed us that you know, knew how to present our brand to, to people. So same thing with the creators, because really I treat everyone like they're sponsoring us. And um, it's, just, it's just interesting to see how the blogging, the interviewing that we did to spotlight our guests in advance, and uh, even going so far as to talking to other events. Other events have started to come to me to say, what comics should I have at my event? Which people performed really well at intervention? And I am more than happy to say, you know, this person, this person, this person did really well and just recommend them. So this is the kind of stuff that people don't see that's behind the scenes. You know, I'm always happy to, to recommend people that help me. So. And I think it, it goes back to the origins of the event itself, like why we did it. Which is we wanted to go to an event that we wanted to do an event that we would want to be a part yeah. of. And being on both sides of the table, so to speak, you know, the people that would vend at an event or be a guest at an event, starting that, you know, we tried to be cognizant of what do those people want to get out of going to an event? Well, of course, you want to make some money, you want to network with other people and you want to have fun and um, the same thing is true when you just you know you're an attendee of an event you know you, you know even if you are not really I'm gonna be the next big webcomic or next big podcaster most people have some desire to look into those areas so we wanted to make it fun so you could go and listen to music play video games play board games go to a dance um, you know meet your favorite creator but also have the other parts where you know, if you really did want to start extending yourself, um, we gave you the opportunity to do that. Um, and it just really, I, I think it naturally flowed out of our ideas of making sure that everything wasn't what's in it for us. It was what's in it for everybody who would be involved. 
and trying to think outside of the mindset of the people who own an event. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if you're the owners of anything, you know, we've seen it all the time in the regular commercial world where people go, well, let me see, I'll just raise all my prices and I'll just blah, 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 blah. And, you know, it's all me, 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 me. I don't care what your experience is. No customer service connections whatsoever and your thing doesn't work. Well, you bought it, it's your problem. You know? <laughs> that thing very short-sightedly works, but when people have an opportunity, they go elsewhere. I mean, we, we fully understand that money is tight and people aren't going to go to an event that they don't feel connects with them. And really that's where we try to do as much as we can to be all, you know, see all sides and try to, to do it as much as we can. You know, another thing that you guys made some noise about recently that I got really excited about is you got Wi-Fi at the event for the guests. Which I'm like, are there conventions that still don't have Wi-Fi? There probably are, but it just seems like such a no-brainer that you'd want to have Wi-Fi because you want your the people who are tabling, if they're having a good time, you want them to be able to say it immediately. You want them to say, I'm having a great time in intervention. Here's a picture of me having a good time, right? That's promotion for you, right? I'm going to SPX next week, and I plan on documenting as much of my experience as I can. I would have gone to intervention, guys, but it was a last-minute thing. I didn't actually intend on going to SPX until two weeks ago. Uh, and actually, I'd love, to, I'd love to talk with you guys later on about uh, some possible workshop ideas for intervention. Yeah. But, but anyway, um, but, you know, I, I, one of my favorite stories to tell is a convention I went to a couple years back where I was trying to figure out if they had Wi-Fi or not. I go up to the kiosk where the, inf the information person was there, and I said, hey, do you guys got Wi-Fi? And she honestly said to me, I think you have to get on the Internet to get Internet here. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> And so I, I realized at that point, okay, this conversation isn't going anywhere. I'm going to go back to my table. I'm going to be angry because I wanted to, you know, share some of the stuff that was happening here, and now I can't because I have to get on the Internet to get some Internet. Um, it's, it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of venues um, end up with situations where the venue itself makes that a, res a revenue generator for mm -hmm. the venue. I'm not talking about, you know, the con. I'm talking about literally you're at this convention center. And, um, you know, they expect that people who are guests or vendors are going to pay the venue, you know, to do it. And we didn't really want to get into a situation where at an Internet-based convention, you didn't have at least a baseline, you know, ability to do it. Now, of course, if somebody were to go to our event and wanted to purchase, you know, something from the venue, they, they you know, they have the ability to do that as well. But we wanted to have something where, you know, you just knew you had something, you know, it, it's, it, and we've, again, it's the same thing. We've been in events and how many times have we seen people running around with their little Wi-Fi based, like, you know, credit card skimmer going like this because they can't, they can't get a signal. And, you know, of course we picked the venue itself, the Hilton, we particularly picked because we like the setup. You know, they have free Wi-Fi for everybody in their humongous atrium area. And then we have our supplemental bits. So, I mean, we, you know, we didn't just randomly pick the location. We really wanted to, you know, pick something that would work out for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah, and that, that just leads more to this idea of uh, you try to find a make, a ways to make the guests happy, for crying out loud. And that's, that's not a small job either when you're dealing with several hundred people. Um, but three headlines I picked up in what you were talking about. You, when designing a public event of any sort, I, I bet this would go for anything that you do. Um, there should be a social component to it, a fun component to it, a professional development component to it. What's in it for me? Am I going to walk out a little bit better at what I do? Or am I going to walk out with some interesting thoughts and I'm going to crunch on for a while? And then a networking component, because this is why you get out of the studio is for these three things, to have fun, to get better at what you do, and then also to make, make a few connections. Like you were talking, Oni, about... Uh, raising the status of some of the guests through your promotional efforts so that now they're being invited to other shows. This is part of the whole deal of making a name for yourself as a cartoonist, right? It's not just about like making a great comic and putting it on the internet and then it, magically people are going to find it, right? You have to also elevate yourself as somebody worth talking to, don't you? Yeah, I look at it as, you know, you can make $500 to $1,000 at a convention, but if you can actually use your convention appearance... Oh... Looks like we froze on the video right at the tail end of the show. You guys still there? Oh, I think we you might have totally gotten it. froze. Yeah, okay. I got, I got you on audio. Oh, okay, good. You were there we go. 
Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! You can make you can make five thousand dollars at a convention, but if you can't. Oh, if if you can't. Um, the whole point of having intervention the way we're doing it is that I looked at it as being a component of helping people make that their appearance into something more. Because I know when I go to events, you know, you can make a little bit of money or you can do something that will actually improve your reputation all around. I, I kind of look at it, at it more like that. I think I had something more elaborate I was saying. <laughs> well, again, I mean, well, on that point, um, you know, at the end of the event, we have a so how did we do panel last year, and we have it again scheduled uh, this year. It's opposite nothing. So um, you know anybody who wants to talk and, and give feedback can positive totally and negative. Know. We want to hear all of it yeah. because if we don't hear anything negative. We can't make it better. And oh, um, I just remembered what I was going to say. Okay, go the thing that frustrated me at some other events is that they would have me as a guest and then I would say hey can you put a clickable link to my website so that people that may not know who I am yet can kinda click and get some information about me before the event and some of these events will just say no we don't put clickable links and that's an ahrefs statement it takes me about three seconds to type yes. probably one second to type so I mean this is the kind of thing that you know we just looked at and said we want an event that raises the bar all around. We want an event that realizes its guests are not just people sitting in tables giving you money. In fact, the price on our tables is low for a reason. I mean, I think it's what eighty bucks just to exist Base, with us. The basic would be eighty bucks. And and people are like, what the heck's wrong with you? You should be charging a couple hundred. And I'm like, that's not the point right now. You know, we want to raise the bar. We want to have links so that people can go to the, the person's site, see who they are, get excited about them, read an interview we did with them on our blog, and then just say, hey, I want to go and see this person. It benefits us because then people want to go. Well, it's the same thing with the Artist Alley people who are, uh, you know, vendors, pure, pure vendors yeah, we, as we opposed to guests. Um, you know, they, we specifically wanted them to be able to show off who they are. So if you go to the website, you see it, you know, they gave us a blurb, they have a picture, they have the link to their site. We have a listing of what they're selling. They're in the con book that way. Yeah, I don't think any um, other convention puts that much for their artists. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, you know, purposefully, we wanted to give people the ability to promote themselves as, you know, being a, a major part of the event. I mean, if you, I mean, everybody's probably gone to an event where you walk into the vendor's room and it's just a sad, sad thing, um, and you have no idea. I mean, how many times have people gone to an event where afterwards they had, they were like, oh man, it was that person in the corner. I have no idea what their name was, but they had this one thing and I couldn't get back there. I couldn't buy it. Well, you know what? Go to our website. You'll be able to find them, but you, you know, yeah. go through all the links until you find them. They're, you know, it's not some random thing where you can't find it. And that was another goal. Again, going back to doing things that we wanted to have for ourselves when we were vending at an event. I just imagine everyone's me and, and it works. <laughs> <laughs> You know, one last point that I was going to get to earlier was the feedback panel that we had last year. Um, I mean, one of the things, and I don't know, you know, we probably couldn't stop smiling after this, but the number of people that were saying that, you know, this event really gave me the opportunity to do what you were saying, you know, uh, have some fun, uh, you know, learn some things that I didn't know, and talk with people one-on-one -on -one in a way that I've never been able to do at another event. You know, part of that was, you know, 500 people let you do a lot of that too. But, you know, the fact that a lot of the events are really specifically designed around the idea of you in a smallish kind of group with somebody who will say, you know what, I tried this, how to make money this way, and you know what, it didn't, it didn't work. You, you, this is why it didn't work. Maybe you want to try something different. And then, you know, if you can't see that particular panel, we also put up a large number of our panels online afterwards. Um, and our goal is to continue with that process and put a lot of our panel content up. So you guys, you guys video the panels? Is that what you're doing this year? We videoed, I think it's something like, we did about 30 plus hours last year. Unfortunately, because we were, you know, a uh, skeleton crew last year, not all, you know, like you try to set up a camera and run away and then it doesn't always pick up everything in a, in a way you can do it. But I, I think we have at least 12 hours of our programming last year. Um, online. So if you go to the Intervention Con website on the left side, uh, lower left side, you'll see the archive for the 2010 event. One of the links there is to uh, the panel videos. Um, oh, there it is. Yeah. 
you know, go there. They're free. They're always going to be free. They're always going to be there. We're never taking them down. It's never going to be a paywall. And this year we have plans to hopefully expand and, and have even more. Uh, this is awesome because this is, I mean, this is just good business sense too, because this is an ongoing advertisement for you. This is a free way for people to see, should I go? What's in it for me? I can go to the, 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 the programming schedule right now and go, okay, let's see. Writing unique heroes and memorable villains. That sounds interesting. I can go getting paid to blog. That sounds interesting. What can I expect? You have video now. People can see. They can try before they buy, so to speak. I mean, that's just, that just makes perfect sense. And that's something we're trying to do with Kids Read Comics as well, is try to capture as much video as we can so people can get some sense of expectation. If you want to get the general public involved, if you want people to try out your thing, um, Gosh, that's just, it, and it's funny that you give it away for free like that, too, because I can see, like, a more 20th century convention saying, like, ah, premium content, more things I can monetize, you know? Um, okay, well, we, we are moving on to book recommendation seg segment here in a second, but I wanted to give you guys uh, a, an opportunity for any final thoughts on this whole building and event thing. Uh, one last uh, plea for people to check out Intervention on the 16th. Oh, uh, my friend Rob Stenzinger is going to be there. Uh, yeah. He's he's doing a, a, a workshop for you guys. Uh, yeah, it's on web. Yeah, web development, app development. Yep, storytelling to make your comics user interface awesome. Uh, and I've seen this this workshop in action. It's a really great workshop. And uh, Rob's going to be on next week. We're going to talk a little bit about, and I'm going to I'm going to pick your guys' ears about this a little bit later. Um, I think I sent you an email about it, uh, Oni. Uh, this thing called uh, Lean Into Art: Thirty Classes in Thirty Days. I know you're totally up to your eyeballs in emails right now, so I did not expect a response right away. Yeah, I saw that. I was like, that looks really cool. Oh wait, hundred more emails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, I, I like I said, I, I not bringing this up. Up on the air to like make you say, oh, you got to respond to it today. I, I'm not expecting to hear from you probably until October. Um, but but yeah, it's just next week, Rob and I are going to talk a lot about it. This idea that we're starting a online unconference where every day for the month of November we're going to host an online workshop for uh, working cartoonists. And I'll just extend the invitation publicly. I'd love for you guys to lead something for us on that. But we'll talk about it later. But. I'm sure we can figure yeah, out a way. We of, were, we of were being leaning involved. heavily toward a yes, but again, I only looked at it for about eight seconds. No, no problem, no problem. But uh, yeah, that's at that's at leanintoart.com for anybody who's interested in the chat. And uh, there's a link to 30 classes in 30 days. Uh, okay, I'll give you guys a chance to do your final thoughts. Anything that you want to say before we glow? Well, I think if anyone wants to start an event, I encourage it. I feel sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I would say you know prepare for five years and um, only do it if you love it because if I didn't love it. this I probably would have jumped off a bridge while shooting myself in the head and lighting myself on fire <laughs> so only do it if you love it and, and just just it's yeah. awesome <laughs> I, I really love it and I, I, I'm looking forward to next weekend even yes. though I know I won't be sleeping <laughs> That's okay. We can take turns. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, two small tips. Always get event insurance. Oh, yes. Always. And always budget way more than you think it could ever be. And know that it's probably going to be even a little bit past that. Yeah. You know, that's just, you know, so many times we've seen people do an event or do something where they get just enough money to do it. And then, you know, they get blindsided by, oh, my God, you mean this could happen and that can happen? And, oh, I got to, like, last year, run out and buy uh, 100-foot Ethernet cables. You know, these things are expensive. So, you know, always um, know that it's, it's going in deep and have the resources to do it, you know, before you yeah. get it. For sure. That, that, that's really good advice because there's always something that either happens that you didn't expect to happen or just a simple little tiny oversight, you know, like you're talking about Ethernet cable. It's like, oh, it's one foot too short. I should have gotten the 25 foot, you know. It's like, I measured this. I know I measured this. Yeah, I don't know how many times that's happened to me with Kids Read Comics even. Like you measure the room. You measure the room three times and then you get the tables. Oh, this happened year one. We measured the room. I had it all mapped out where everybody was going to go. Tables arrived. Oh, they're eight foot instead of six foot tables. Oh. Arrived the morning of the show. And yeah, it was a nightmare just trying to figure out how are we going to rearrange this artist alley right now? Because people are starting to show up with boxes, you know? That was, oh my that's God. Oh, that's really yeah, we had, we had that same level of terror when we were, we were setting our registration up because we were having trouble getting everything yeah, to connect. And just nothing we were doing would work. 
And I was we like, managed, oh, God. We managed if, to if, route around that's when the horror of if this one small thing goes wrong, the entire con mm -hmm. is going to, to domino, and you are going to have an absolute mess. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were able to get it together. Yeah, luckily, thankfully. we were fine. None of this was customer facing, us being like, ah, in the background. Yeah. Saw, but. Yeah, and 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 uh, yeah, it's good to test relationships for sure. That's another thing that happens when you put on something of this this magnitude. Well, you know, you definitely thing, see who has your back and who does not. Well, and everybody came invention. together. It was really great. You know, everybody's yeah. throwing out ideas, and we, you know, we managed to work to make it work. So it was, like the good thing cool. is, our staff, a lot of our staff seems almost more passionate about it than us even. If that could be even possible. I'm like, yeah. calm down. <laughs> We're going to do it. Well, you see that with anything, you know, it's like how many people, you know, for Apple products, I mean, you know, you know, the people who work at Apple love what they're doing, but how many people would like stab somebody, you know, if they said, so, Steve Jobs, what, why? he doesn't, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, and, and you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, people, you know, you set it up right, people, you know, they, they like it and they, they want to support it. Hey. Well, <laughs> the website is interventioncon.com, and thank you to Eric in the chat for posting all the links throughout this episode. There's been a lot of great resources being pumped into the chat client. That's why people should show up live. You can get these links now instead of waiting for the show notes to show up two days from now. Um, okay, we're going to move on to book recommendations because I have my best library friend here, Sharon Iverson. You don't like me introducing you as like the, you know, the head honcho of comics uh, culture in Ann Arbor, so I'm just going to call you my best library friend. <laughs> That's fine. Hey, you're not coming in on the mic. I'm not hearing you. Oh. Can you guys hear her? Yeah, we can hear her. Oh, okay. Okay, just okay. maybe it's my headphone. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Now you're loud and clear in my ears. It was, right. just, it was just me. Uh, so, you got any book recommendations for us, Sharon? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I have two today. Um, and they're not they're not super new, but they're books that um, I don't know exactly how I found them, except I'm always looking for books um, for boys, and this one's Krogan's Vengeance. It's by uh, Chris Schweitzer, and it's the beginning of a whole saga of books that I think he's planning to do every 18 months, but maybe behind schedule already. I'm not sure. Um, this is a story of Catfoot Krogan, who is a sailor of some ability on a ship called the Vengeance when pirates attack and he is forced to become a part of that pirate crew. Um, he gets along fine with the pirate captain but his first mate, Dor, has it in for him and before it's all and done you will experience a ton of swashbuckling up to your ears. Um, pretty it's exciting lo stuff. Looks very cartoony. Very cartoony, yeah, yeah. very um, black and white. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a sense of it. Um, more cartoony than the next one that I have, which is, um, and this is kind of, oops, oh, Krogan's, Krogan's Vengeance is yeah. kind of a historical um, fiction with a lot thrown in, where the next one is really spun kind of off of um, Canadian history. It's the annotated Northwest Passage by Scott Chandler. And it's um, Canadian history. I've had, we don't own it. I had to borrow it from another library system. Um, but it's the story of a hero who is um, this fellow on the cover. His name is Charles Lord, and he's about to retire from his post at Fort Newcastle, which is the fictional site of the Hudson Bay um, Company headquarters in North America. Um, in history, that site was fought over by the English and French like six times. So this, this of course, is fictionalized, but it is a story of how that fort is taken by French mercenaries. Mm -hmm. And there's all sorts of deaths. And um, Charles Lord and the survivors of the attack have to go out and seek friends um, and allies from the Native Americans and try to take that fort back. Um, I think this, too, is planned as a continuing saga um, as uh, I read on the website. So I'm waiting to see whether we'll have some more, but uh, great books for boys, a lot of action, um, little history mixed in. So 
pretty good. Yeah, Northwest Passage. And the, man, it's funny that there was just that book by, uh, that I was just talking about before we recorded, Lewis Real, by, mm -hmm. uh, which is another Canadian history book. And, wow, the art is like super smooth and it has like a lot of brush. Look, well, here I can put it up on the camera for people who want to want, look at this. Mm -hmm. uh, smooth brushwork kind of stuff. I love that you brought up that you got this through Melcat because <laughs> this is something we should be letting the yeah. listeners know is if you yeah. go to your local library, most libraries do this. Mm -hmm. You go there, you're like, I want to find this book. I want to find this graphic novel that I'm really excited about. Oh, you don't have it. Well, go to your librarian, your mm -hmm. U13 librarian, and say, mm -hmm. hey, can you get it? And they can borrow it from other libraries, right? That, right. We've got Melcat, and we also have Interlibrary Loan exactly. in, at the Ann Arbor District Library. You can find virtually anything that way. Right? Well, and I, I'm pretty sure I found out about Northwest Passage by reading a review of Krogan. Um, and said, you know, if you like, you know, if you like Krogan's Vengeance, you'll you'll want to read, you know, the annotated Northwest Passage, and that's when I went on the hunt, the <laughs> hunt, and now we're going to make it a part of our collection too. So. And that's the other thing that can happen is if mm -hmm. your if your library sees a lot of demand for those things, then they can add it to their collection. Yeah, right. absolutely. Right. Um, I have book recommendations that are tied into calendar events. We got to talk mm -hmm. about calendar events that are coming up. Uh, do you guys did you guys have any books that you wanted to recommend on the show today, or or I'm I'm kind of catching a flat footed here. I didn't really prepare you for that. So <laughs> my favorite, and and it's it's silly and it's girly, but I, I'm a big fan of the Peach Girl series by Miwa Ueda. Mm -hmm. I don't and think I've read that. It's I, I just love it. I don't know. It's just it reminds me like a lot of it's. It's definitely for girls, I would say. I mean, although every guy I've given it to and that has read it has been like, I hate you, but that was awesome. <laughs> you're, you're, yeah, you're talking to a guy who watches My Little Pony, though I don't identify myself as a brony, so <laughs> so I might like it. Uh, what, what's the premise? It's about a uh, Japanese girl who has the blonde hair and the darker skin, and she gets seen as being, um, you know, not as, I, I, I guess that's kind of, a lot of girls that look like that in Japan are seen as loose or, or, you know, not very reputable. So she fights against that whole thing because she naturally gets the darker skin. And she, it's, it's basically evolves into like this love triangle and, and her and her best friend or their frenemies kind of. And then there's these two guys and it goes really crazy. And it yeah. does have, it's not for little, little kids, I would say, because it does have some, yeah, some, some situations in it that are, that are very adult, but I really liked it. It just reminded me of growing up and, and high school and things like that. Yeah, high school. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Peach Girls and Eric already put a link in the chat. Gosh, you're awesome, Eric. Um, <laughs> Okay, so events, uh, we talked about intervention coming up. Uh, let me repeat the date one more time. It is September 16th through the 18th, 2011, at the Hilton, Washington, D.C. in Rockville, uh, interventioncon.com for in maps and all sorts of information. But we got other events going on locally. Mm -hmm. What do we got going on locally, Sharon? The this forum. coming Sunday, September 11th, it, from 1 to 3, we have our first comic artist forum, and that will be with our guest artist, Jay Foskett. So, and he's creator of Dead Duck Comics and um, some other projects. And uh, the forum is an open, free event where cartoonists from around the area and aspirant cartoonists, people mm -hmm. who are just like, you know, uh, somewhat curious about comics can come and uh, hang out with other cartoonists and draw a little bit. And there's a little mm -hmm. short presentation by a guest speaker. Mm -hmm. Totally free. How awesome is that? It's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. Yeah. I mean. And that starts our monthly cycle for right. the forum, right? right. So it uh, starts in September 10th, or September 11th, and then... October 2nd. October 2nd. Yeah, it's usually the first Sunday of, of each month. Now, I won't be mm -hmm. able to make this one because I'm going to be at SPX on mm -hmm. September 11th, but uh, the next month I will be there for mm -hmm. that for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, every month you get a, f you get a free presentation by a, a, a working cartoonist, and then mm -hmm. you also get to do some networking, have some fun, and some professional development like we were talking about earlier. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, is that, we got uh, anything else going on? Don't we have the, the forum follow-ups? Does that not start till? That'll be in October. Yeah. So okay. yeah, after we have the October second forum, we'll have the follow-up on. Mm -mm, I have to cheat and look at my notes. Jersey. <laughs> Sorry. Too many things. I was gonna pull up my calendar on it's, my phone because I don't remember either. It's on the sixteenth. That's right. Yeah, the six. I have to talk to you after this is done, Jersey, because yeah. we have many things coming up in I October. Know. I know yep. we do. <laughs> so, but yes, the forum follow up is what? It's um, going to be on Photoshop. It's three hours of just kind of opening up, and I haven't talked to you whether you want to do a little instruction, but it's just a chance for cartoonists to come in to clean up their artwork, um, apply color, and 
half tones and all access those to things. a scanner, access to Adobe yes. Photoshop Elements, access to new Macintosh computers yes. to do the work on for free. Right, and we want them to you know do their work and then make their work if they're willing available to post on our digital library. And that's another layer to this. Yes. This is so cool. So yes. okay, we're providing access to the computer labs, let people clean up their work, and then if they complete it, if they finish it, they can add it to the Ann Arbor District Library's digital collection of comics, mm -hmm. so that people can check it out on whatever kind of mobile device that they have. That is so, so cool that you guys are doing this. Uh, I wish more libraries did what you guys are doing. But uh, okay, any other events that we need to point people at? At this point, I'm going to be back at the end of the month, and we'll talk about all that October stuff coming up. The Teen Read Week, which is themed around Picture It, we're really pushing the graphic novel end of things. So Awesome. Which is natural. <laughs> so I got my book recommendations, which are my books. Mm -hmm. I rarely promote myself on my show. But, uh, yeah, I got two new books that I brought for you, my best library friend. Uh, mm -hmm. So these are going to be debuting at SPX, Boulder and Fleet. Adv oh, I, yeah, there's the cam camera. Boulder and Fleet Adventures for Hire. I just finished screen printing the covers on these and then also eight scary things by jared for those who haven't seen it it's my little jared crane Aww. comics comics written and drawn by jared my abominable snowman character and cool. it's eight things that frighten him uh, just in time for halloween there's a, even a cute skeleton on the back <sighs> so yeah and boulder and fleet is the story of um a bird and a bear who are adventurers for hire and they like just like bill bixby in the incredible hulk or in what was that one that that story about the family that moves around in a Winnebago fixing people's problems. It's <laughs> that kind of idea, yeah. except the bird is always trying to get the bear to charge for the jobs, and he doesn't do it. Um, he keeps doing it for free and makes the bird really mad. So, But yeah, those will be at SPX this weekend, so you can check those out. Neat. So those are for you. Thank you. Yep. So thank you for coming and sure, talking with us, Sharon. Sure. And thank you to Onizumi and to Harknell for taking time out of your very, very busy schedules to talk about intervention. Uh, and if you're going to be in the area, or even if you're not going to be in the area, you should go uh, to interventioncon.com. So uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks for having no us. No problem. And we'll, we'll talk to you in about probably about three, four weeks when you're healed. <laughs> we might actually see you this weekend if we're going down. We may be we may, down there. We may yeah. actually go down to we'll six. See. Oh, cool. Well, yeah, yeah, I'll be at table G10. So if you want to stop by and say hi, I'll be there. Uh, I'll be doing the crayon drawings. Awesome. Uh, cool. Thanks again, guys. Uh, th thanks, Sharon and the Ann Arbor District mm -hmm. Library for putting the show on. Really appreciate it. This is a lot of fun. This is the highlight of my week. So thank you guys for making that possible. Uh, and until next time, everybody, this show is streamed live every Wednesday at 1, or 1230 p.m. Eastern Time at comicsgreat.tv. Show notes will be available at comicsgreat.com in a couple days after this episode go uh, airs. And uh, you'll be able to download it as a video or audio podcast. And uh, until next time, I've been Jersey Droz of, of ComicsGreat.com and Jersey on the Twitters. Okay, bye.